Welcome to Module 3. We're going to be looking at the consequences of the second law in this lesson. So our goals here, now you have to remember that this is a review. So these topics, the first time we covered them, were probably pretty tough, and we're going to go fairly quickly. But the primary goals, first, we want to be able to recognize when a process may be reasonably modeled as reversible and identify what it is about that process that is leading to generation of entropy. Then we want to evaluate whether a process is possible or not based on thermodynamics. We will evaluate the performance of processes and cycles using thermodynamic efficiencies and process efficiencies. And finally, we will be calculating changes in entropy for cases where the data tables are not available. Now, to really understand what the second law is trying to do for us, it's very helpful to talk about cycles. A cycle is just simply a series of processes where you start at a state and you go through a several steps and you come back to the same state. Now this cycle can either produce power or require power input. If it produces power, it's a heat engine. If it requires power input, then we classify it as a refrigerator. This is a simple heat engine. We'll be looking more at these in a future lesson. But this is a simple ranking cycle, for instance. And what happens is you start with some liquid that's pumped up to a higher pressure. It then goes to a boiler where it's heated to a higher temperature. So it's at a high pressure and temperature and has a lot of energy. It's then going to be sent onto a turbine where that energy is going to be turned into power. So it leaves the turbine at a lower pressure, usually also a lower temperature, and then is condensed back to form that liquid that's going to go back through the pump. So this is a cycle. Now if it is a cycle, there's no net change in any of the state properties, so net, no net change in kinetic energy, potential energy, internal energy, enthalpy. So the net work over the course of the cycle is going to exactly equal the net heat over the course of the cycle. And since it's a heat engine, we know that we're going to produce power, which means that the work produced in the turbine is going to be more than is required in the pump. A heat engine always requires heat input. Okay. Now also since net work equals net heat, that means that net heat transfer is always going to be positive. We require heat input and we get work output. Now this is a very simple vapor compression refrigeration cycle. In this case, we take a material uh, that is a gas, we send it through a compressor to get it to a higher pressure, we're then going to condense it back to being a liquid, then we need to just get the pressure back down to the low pressure so we run it through an expansion valve and then back through the evaporator to get it into a, the gas state again. So again, we complete that cycle. Now we have to put power into a refrigerator, but what happens is we're going to take heat in at one temperature and put it out at a, low, at a different temperature. Okay. So they always are going to require power input and they're going to always remove more heat than they produce. Now the way we measure performance in a cycle is to, all of our measures of performance are going to be sort of like this. We're going to take whatever the desired effect is, what is our goal out of this process or cycle or whatever, and divide by what's the cost for this. Okay. So for a heat engine, our goal is power. Okay? The cost is that heat input we're having to put in at, say, the boiler. And so we end up with net power over heat transfer in is going to be this thermal efficiency. Net work is equal to net heat. If I look at the heat in and out, the heat at the low temperature is added to the heat at the high temperature 
Heat at the low temperature is out of the system, so it's negative. Heat at the high temperature is positive, it's into the system. So this 1 plus QL over QH, QL over QH will be a negative, right? A negative over a positive is negative. And so a lot of times it's easier to put 1 minus the absolute value of those. It's easier to work with values rather than having to keep track of the signs. For a refrigerator, our goal is going to be cooling the stuff that's already at the low temperature, okay? But the cost is energy input. And so we end up with these expressions here for coefficient of performance. But sometimes we use the refrigerator as a heat pump. So our goal then is the heat. I don't know if you've ever like stood behind a refrigerator on a really cold day in a house uh, trying to warm up. This would be using your refrigerator as a heat pump. So a heat pump, the goal is Q sub H. It's the high temperature heat transfer. And the cost is still net work. And we end up with these expressions. Again, I'm using absolute values, so you don't have to worry about what the sign convention is. A lot of times we're going to look at really simple, like, cartoon drawings almost of what a cycle looks like. So a heat engine is going to produce power, work is coming out of the cycle, and it's going to take heat from something at a high temperature and put it into the cycle, into the engine, okay? And then it's also going to push heat out of the engine to something at a low temperature. A refrigerator is going to take heat out of something that's already at a cold temperature, say our food, put it into the engine, add some power to be able to put heat out to something that's at a higher temperature. So that's what our simple cycle devices look like, one of these two drawings. The, there are many, many statements of the second law. One that's interesting is the Clausius statement. Now the Clausius statement tells me about what's impossible. It says that it's impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle Okay. and produces no effect on the surroundings other than the transfer of heat from a colder body to a hotter body. So I can't take heat out of something cold and put it into something hot. I can't, you know, take my ice cubes and use those to, you know, heat up the room, right? They're going to chill off the room. So the heat transfer doesn't work in this direction. The only way I can make this happen is by doing heat or work input. So a refrigerator is the same as this with work input. The Calvin Planck statement of the second law is a similarly impossible statement. It says it's impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle and produces no effect on the surroundings other than producing heat and exchanging heat with a single reservoir. In other words, if I take power input into a cycle to produce power, I'm going to always have to have some heat loss to something at a lower temperature. Right, so you run your car and you know that after you've been running it for a while there's always going to be some warmth <laughs> uh, under the hood where the heat has been being released from the cycle. So what these statements of the second law tell us is limitations. It says I can cool objects from cold to hot, but only if I use power input. And it says I can turn heat into work, but there's always going to be some lost heat. Okay? And we also have a de definition of thermal efficiency. Work is a work over the heat transfer in at the high temperature. And because QL over QH will be negative, in absolute value, we know that this is going to be a quantity less than 1 and also greater than 0. We also can prove, using picture math, that the Kelvin-Planck statement and the Clausius statement are the same. So, for instance, if you were to do picture math, you create a heat engine and add a Clausius device to it, okay, 
where the QL in the heat engine is the same but in opposite direction as in the Clausius device, what you end up with is a Kelvin Planck device, okay, where with a different heat transfer from the hot temperature and power out. But you took something possible, you added something impossible to it, and you get something else impossible. So you can play with that. You probably did this in a previous course. But the idea here is that these two statements sound very different, but really they are, in fact, the same. So we're going to stop here about reversible processes because we want to start talking now about real processes, things that we actually can do, and whether or not we have the right tools to model them. So we'll see that in the next lesson.